<clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research for our event today, Hidden Workers, Untapped Talent. My name is Brent Orell, and I'm senior fellow here at AEI, and I focus my research on workforce development and prisoner reentry programs. For those of you who are new to AEI, I just want to read to you very quickly what our vision statement is, because I think it's very relevant to our conversation today. We are a public policy think tank dedicated to defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and building a freer and safer world. The work of our scholars and staff advances ideas rooted in our belief in liberal democracy, free enterprise, American strength and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society, and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. Much of the vision statement I just read applies to today's event. The workers that we're talking about today are often on the periphery of society, but they are human beings with great dignity and potential, and all of them are seeking access to opportunity, the kind of opportunity that the American economy and our society affords. So it's eminently suitable that we be gathered here at AEI for this critical conversation about hidden workers. As you may have noticed, we are suffering through a bit of a labor shortage. The challenge isn't new. In non-recessionary periods, the pool of available workers has, over the past decade or more, contracted uh, and become smaller over time. Today's labor market challenge now spans a much broader swath of the economy, and variety of skill sets. As of March 1 of this year, we have uh, nearly 5 million available jobs in the United States. Um, and that is nearly two jobs for every available worker. As labor market information research firms like MZ Burning Glass have corroborated, these conditions are not new but a continuation and an exacerbation of long-term trends for which there are no easy solutions. Between an aging population, low fertility rates, a drop in workforce participation generally, and declining immigration, we can anticipate a chronic long-term shortage of workers that will interact with technological change and skill mismatches to make finding, training, and retaining workers even harder than it already is. AEI non-resident uh, senior fellow, Joe Fuller, and his <clears throat> colleagues at Harvard Business School have taken a unique look at this challenge and are proposing a unique and important solution. The key, Joe and his colleagues believe, lies in boosting labor force participation among what they call hidden workers, people who can and should, and most importantly, want to be working but for a variety of reasons are not. Sometimes they are youth without high school degrees. Sometimes they are individuals with criminal records who have trouble closing the deal with potential employers. Sometimes they are veterans who need help translating the skills they learned in the military to uh, in-demand civilian jobs. And sometimes they're people with disabilities who need to work and want to work but also need specialized accommodations to make that desire a reality. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Joe Fuller. He's a non-resident fellow, senior fellow here at AEI, and a professor of management at Harvard Business School and co-director of Harvard Kennedy School's project on managing the future of work. We're also joined by Ardeen Williams, vice president of workforce development at this small company that you may have heard of called <coughs> Amazon and Steve Preston, president of Goodwill Industries. Joe is gonna kick us off with an overview of his research, followed by responses from our Dean and Steve, and then we'll have a back and forth to tease out some of the issues and potential responses to the challenges that Joe and his colleagues have identified. We'll be taking questions later, so if you have one, feel free to tweet it to hashtag AEI Hidden Workers, or send my research assistant, Jessie Wall, an email. Her email address is jessie, J 
J-E-S-S-I-E dot wall, W-A-L-L, at A-E-I dot org. So Joe, get us started. Well, Brent, thanks, and um, delighted to be here. I think the understanding of the origins of this work uh, is embedded in the title of the work of the paper we published called Hidden Workers, Untapped Talent. When we started looking at this market, we were trying to understand more granularly who was on the fringe of the, of the labor force. Because if you look at the data that's available, you'll hear, oh, there, here's the difference between the U3 rate, the nameplate unemployment rate, and the U6 rate, which includes people working part-time uh, but not able to get more hours. Or we'll have, um, we'll have discouraged workers or long-term unemployed. But it it's, gave us no texture, no understanding of what was driving those people's conditions. Why were they on the fringes of the labor force? And therefore, we, we looked at um, populations in the UK, Germany, and the United States. We wanted to take a somewhat less, uh, uh, US is the most kind of liquid, <clears throat> free-flowing labor market. UK, a little bit more constrained. Germany, still more constrained looked at populations of workers who are on the fringe of the labor force in each of those countries. And we also spoke to employers about the way they go about looking for workers. And that brought about this name, hidden workers. Because what we found is the process by which employers seek out applicants and assess applicants effectively screens out of consideration large numbers of workers. And that's largely effectuated by the implementation of something called an applicant tracking system or ATS system. An ATS system is a piece of, we would call it artificial intelligence. It's certainly artificial. I don't know how intelligent it is, uh, which uh, looks at the attributes of an applicant against some predetermined uh, variables, such as how many years of experience do you have? Do you have a college degree? Do you have a criminal conviction? Uh, have you been continuously in the workforce in the last six months? So there are a variety of variables that are applied to assess the relative attractiveness of the candidate. That's an important thing to hold fast to because this is not, uh, I would never employ this person in a million years. It's, I'm just trying to take a pool of applicants, often a large pool of applicants, hundreds of applicants for a single position, and winnow it down to a manageable consideration set. And I do that by using this so-called ATS to both filter, i.e., you're in the pool to be continued to consider or you're out based on your response to a single question, and to rank those who supply, uh, the applicants who survive the filtering process. So I can take that pool of two, three, four hundred applicants, and that's what a job that pays fifty to sixty thousand dollars in a large corporate would attract pre-COVID, down to the four, five, or six I'm going to actively consider. And that is about the right ratio. Companies winnow down the number of applicants for a single position very, very quickly to those candidates they think are the best fit. And they use it using these filters but also by applying what's called natural language processing to look at the person's applicant and compare application, compare it to the job description. So what did we find out of this? The first is that, that a large number of workers are screened out without ever being assessed by a human being in this effort to winnow down the pool for failing on one or two of these uh, filters. So, for middle skills jobs, which are jobs that are defined as those that require something more than a high school diploma, but less than a four-year degree, in the United States, 50% of employers eliminate an applicant, filter them out, if they have, uh, have not been employed in the last six months. They're just out. Now, if we take a step back from employer's perspective, we can say, well, why, did, why would that make sense? Well. You might think maybe that person doesn't have a lot of self-efficacy, a lot of get up and go, doesn't seem like all you know, former colleagues they have or scrambling to get them 
you know, to join them wherever they were working next. Maybe you're worried that their skills are atrophying a little bit. But six months isn't a very long time. If you were moving Transcon as a military spouse from 29 Palms to Camp Lejeune, it might take you about six months to get settled. Six months sounds like uh, my, uh, my wife and I, our first pregnancy, were twins, and she spent the last three months of her pregnancy not working, not moving around a lot because it was a high-risk pregnancy. So it wouldn't take much of a high-risk pregnancy to consume six months or one of your parents being terminally ill. So the filters can have this unaffected, this un unintended consequence of rather arbitrarily filtering people out of consideration uh, simply because they fall down a single attribute. In this quest to have a highly efficient process, just give me the four or five people who are the best fit Number 13, number 14, number 15, I'm not worried about, let alone number 196 or 394. Now, the effect of this is, is, is funny in, in multiple ways. I think it contributes materially to our poor workforce participation rate. And you know, for, for those <clears throat> American chauvinists out there, our workforce participation rate is less than the EU's. It's decidedly less than France. So if, if, we, you know, if we think you know, America is the, the, you know, the, the strong-backed working economy, uh, there's something that doesn't fit. It's called data with that story. What's also interesting about this is that companies acknowledge that the way they filter these candidates leaves a significant number of qualified people out of the process. They'll, almost 90% will say some of the time, most of the time, or all the time, we know that we're losing highly qualified candidates. But in this quest to be efficient, we understand that there's kind of collateral damage, as they'd say in the military. And that's too bad, but we're, we're fine. We, we have to find a way to do this quickly. Interestingly, in most companies, the people called recruiters are primarily evaluated on two things. How much money did I spend hiring this person? And how long did it take to hire the person? That's it. They don't get evaluated on, did the person stay with us for more than a nanosecond? They do not get evaluated on, we hired somebody that was highly productive of the job and viewed as a candidate for quick promotion or was, in fact, promoted. They just fill the seat, move on to the next one. Now, as we looked at this, we were trying to understand who were these hidden workers. In the United States are about 27 million. And they're the types of candidates that Brent was talking about. They're people with no high school diploma. They're people who are, and, and no relevant practical training. Uh, they are veterans who very often find, particularly enlisted, making the transition difficult because that natural language processing that reads their application for, let's say, uh, a, uh, uh, an infantryman doesn't see anything about product management, doesn't see any keywords in there about, about managed budgets, made senior management presentations, or whatever else. And it's not very intelligent. It doesn't say, well, this person who was a staff sergeant in the Air Force isn't going to be using words like that. Doesn't think at all. It just says, <clears throat> not what I'm looking for, out. Um, it is people with uh, physical and uh, mental challenges. Um, it is uh, offend people um, with criminal records. Um, it's also caregivers. Now, we identify these hidden workers, and the m biggest category of them are part-time workers who want more hours. That's easily the biggest category. But let's go back to both the categories. I may be a part-time worker because I don't have a good caregiving solution for my kids outside certain hours. But also, once you're a part-time worker, how does the AI see you? Increasingly, it sees you as someone who's ideally qualified to be a part-time worker. Mm. But it doesn't see you as someone who can step up to that next role. And very often, part-time workers are either providing a supplementary income that's critical to their household or trying to get by on that. And they can't just start missing shifts to go after jobs that they're unlikely to get. Missing workers get to the point of getting a job offer with about 1.7% of the applications they submit. So it's a very, very low probability 
for them. Now we might say, oh, they're overreaching, they're going after jobs that they're not qualified for. Could be, but if you were getting no, 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 90.3% of the time, my guess is you'd get a little discouraged about applying too. Um, the, um, as we looked at this from a more affirmative point of view, because we wanted to understand were these populations capable of occupying productive roles and getting hours, beginning to develop a more rich skill set so they may qualify for further advancement, what we found is very encouraging that companies that have developed programs to dip into one or more of these subpopulations of hidden workers to give them whatever set of accommodations they need to get into a job in their place of employment report terrific results. So that employers that have developed usually a program for just a couple of populations, not everybody. They're, we found no one who said, we're just going to try to hire whatever category of hidden worker we want. But an easy one to imagine is veterans. There are some companies with very successful programs in helping uh, veterans make the transition. Unsurprisingly, probably the premier company in the United States is USAA, which serves veterans uh, and is staffed by veterans. But they know what a Marine S-11 is. And they know what it takes to take that Marine, mustering out Marine S-11, and turn that person into a customer service rep. Uh, they're uh, a blossoming, I think in part due to research by people like Brent, of second chance initiatives for people with criminal background records. Uh, felon, felonies, convictions are only about 5% related to violent crime. But if you are an African American woman with a felony conviction, your unemployment rate <coughs> pre-COVID was still over 50%. So, by developing these programs, companies found that didn't take that much to accommodate workers into their workforce, but what they got, the employer got, was rewarded. And not rewarded with the soft benefit of the non-hidden worker, co-workers feel better about us now. They got a productive worker, more productive, according to the employers, than their open cycle normal hiring, less likely to turn over, more likely to stay for an extended period of time. So there was an economic benefit to making the marginal set of accommodations by engaging those hidden worker populations, often by approaching someone who is genuinely expert in that population, uh, someone like a Goodwill Industries, helping them, getting their help in making the transition, understanding what it was gonna take, not just I'm gonna open the aperture of my hiring to include these people, but I'm going to hold them to the exact same standard. I'm going to onboard them in the exact same way. I'm going to expect them to be meet the productivity ramp that I expect from a normal worker, but rather build some combinations in to introduce workers so they can be successful. So we left this both discouraged by the magnitude of the problem uh, and the degree to which Hidden workers today are effectively locked on the, on the fringes of the economy because they are screened out of consideration by the technology. But hopeful that as more companies learn that there was a big talent pool out there that could be accessed with fairly marginal accommodations, <coughs> we could start creating some solutions to what is going to be exactly, as Brent said, a very tight labor market for the foreseeable future. And finally, I'll just add that there was a complimentary paper that, uh, uh, as in supportive of, not uh, given away for free, they're also available for free, uh, called um, Building from the Bottom Up, where we started to look at those entry-level workers and how they could get on pathways to further advancement. So a kind of a plug compatible a set of papers to look at both how we get people out of the fringes of the labor force especially those recently unemployed or, more importantly, locked in part-time positions into full-time positions, and then how do we help more of them get on pathways to um, better positions, better skills, better pay, and more economic independence. So, Brent, let me turn it back to you. Well, thanks, Joe. That was really great, uh, concise introduction. I can tell you've given that talk a couple times. That's uh, very impressive. 
What, um, I, before I turn this over to the other panels, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, you talked about minor accommodations. What kind of minor accommodations um, did you find employers needing to make with, you choose the population, yeah. but yeah. Well, it, it, of course, the first thing is if you understand a population, the specifics of that population, then you know what you have to do. It could be some kind of supplementary training. Um, it could be certainty in hours. If you've got someone with caregiving obligations, if you're talking about shift work, they can't be told on Wednesday that next week they're on the night shift because who's going to take care of their five-year-old? So there has to be stability there. Um, for a, um, uh, It's more easily envisioned for someone with some physical challenges. It could be changes in the, in the configuration of the workspace. Another thing, by the way, I'll just mention, we found that companies really benefited by talking about their desire to do this with incumbent workers who were drawn from that population. Not that if you're a hidden worker, none of them ever gets employed, but if you want to up your engagement with veterans or uh, people with criminal convictions, maybe you've got employees who got through the onboarding process as you've got it configured now as a veteran, and you can engage them in what didn't work, what was hard, what was a barrier, give us advice, will you help us on this? The thing is that, that with, with a rare exception, a lot of the, it, it, much more, the art is in the matching. Mm -hmm. This type of person has the kind of sh shortest transit distance to that role, as opposed to, I'm looking for cyber techs. So let me throw open my door to look for hidden workers who are going to be great at cyber techs. You may find some particularly coming out of the military um, or, interestingly, from cognitive diverse populations. So companies like Microsoft have you know, a very well-functioning programs with people on the autism spectrum. But it's more about how can this population, what's a reasonable a uh, path for them to travel to be productive in my workforce uh, and get them in your workforce first and then see what happens. Terrific. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Nadine. Just, uh, Nadine to Ardine. Uh, Ardine, I'm sorry. My apologies. Uh, Ardine, could you talk us through a little bit, just kind of off the top of your head, just the reactions, uh, your top of mind reactions to what you heard Joe say. So we clearly covered a tremendous, for those who haven't read the paper, a, a lot of ground uh, that, that Joe and his team did. I think the pragmatic, practical pieces, and that's sort of my job, is, I want to latch on to a couple of things that he said. One is to look to the incumbent population that you have. So for example, our, um, our veterans program really grew from a population of veterans in the organization. And when we looked at those folks and said, okay, what attracted you here? And what made it, what helped make you successful? And as we began to interview, we found that interview more purposely on the veterans front in Amazon Web Services. What we found was there was this gap. There was this skills trajectory where we had people who were a great cultural fit. They were, um, they were very clearly eager to learn, and yet they didn't have the requisite technical skills because they were working with uh, technology that came through the government procurement process rather than technology that had been developed by industry. And so thinking about how we closed that gap more effectively and built the services around it to help those um, veterans transition led to a successful um, apprenticeship program. So a very classic DOL registered apprenticeship program but that was focused on technical skills. And that same kind of uh, work around how do we help uh, how do we help you as a veteran? And I, this is, I can say this honestly, I'm a veteran. I, it was like moving into another completely different world when I moved into corporate America. And so understanding what do promotions look like? What does career advancement look like? How do I interact with my boss? Why does he get up? Why is it that when I say yes, sir, it makes him nervous? <laughs> uh, and I, you know, so those kinds of things. We also worked very closely with our logistics side of the house, who employed a lot of military members at the um, at the individual contributor level. But we really wanted to bring in more at the management level. And so helping to understand what made those uh, those who transitioned comfortable, successful, and uh, was really important because we were able to close, as Joe said, that 
that that distance. And so focusing on a a population and looking where you have success and leveraging that is incredibly important. That's terrific. Steve, we're going to turn to you now. Yeah, so first of all, some of you may be wondering why a used clothing retailer is here on the panel, but we uh, Goodwill is actually the largest nonprofit provider of uh, workforce development services in North America. That's been our mission for 180 years or 120 years. And um, we uh, employ about 120,000 people, but about a million people a year come through our workforce centers, and they receive all sorts of support from us. Um, about 80% of those people have a high school degree or less, uh, and they represent many people groups. Almost 60% are people who represent ethnic and racial minorities, tens of thousands of veterans, of uh, uh, people who've been impacted by the justice system, people with disabilities. So when we look at this hidden worker population, those are our people, right? And those are the people that we seek to serve. And part of serving them is not only delivering the service uh, when they find us, but it's finding them to come to us and help them believe that there's a possibility out there. And Joe, I think some of your research shows how difficult it is for people who are applying for roles. Um, and so um, I think one of the things that's, that, in, in, once again, if you haven't seen the full paper, please read it or, or look through it because I think there's some really important things in there. You know, we are constantly talking about the great resignation or the great reconsideration. We love sort of the, the titles and three sentence narratives, but this is a pretty complicated narrative. Now, on one level, I think it's fairly simple. We got 11 million unfilled jobs. We had 20 plus million people that are hidden workers. You know, employers need people, people need those jobs. We need to build that bridge so people can walk over it and benefit from that opportunity. And this problem is not going away. It's expanding, it's accelerating. Companies are investing more in digital platforms, investing more in AI, investing more in automation. And um, so all the research we've seen says it's gonna accelerate and it's gonna grow. And the interesting thing is, you know, we have lower skilled jobs going away, but we have higher skilled, better paying jobs being created. And it's a huge opportunity, right? And so it's, and, and, and what I appreciated about the research, Joe, is we not only, you not only talk about that, but you give visibility into who's out there, how big that pool is, um, but you also talk a little bit more about the kinds of challenges and the kinds of solutions. So when you think about what it takes, number one, we do need to close that skills gap. And the skills are, <laughs> continue to evolve and continue to raise. So this isn't sort of a static issue. It's one of the reasons I'm so happy, um, Ardeen, to hear the great work you guys are doing because the role of the employer um, is so critical because not only do you know what you need today, you know where the skill need is going, you have an embedded population, uh, and you can commit capital. And I think the, the, um, the employer community is so well able to deal with this in a much more nimble, effective way than just about any sector right now because you, you kind of get it all and you're willing to act. And obviously a, a company like Amazon is, is, uh, you know, has you know, grown into a behemoth through constant innovation. So these are the stories that we love to hear. And so thank you, thank you for all that you're doing. But we have that skills gap, right? So we need to work on the provisioning of skills. We need to work on the hiring practices, which Joe, I think is probably one of the heart, most heartbreaking things for us, is to know that those people are out there, that they could be qualified and people are getting screened, screened out before they get at bad. And the, also, the other thing that's so important is employer readiness. Because people are kind of, employers are kind of taking a step into the unknown. Like, how am I going to do this? Are these people going to fit in my culture? What's it going to take to make them successful? And all of those things have to work together to be able to, uh, to solve this issue. And part of that is helping people along that journey. A lot of the people we serve uh, need those skills, but they also need, you know, childcare so they can yeah. go to a class. They need transportation to go to a job interview. Some of the people with deeper challenges need, need uh, you know, stable housing. And so the whole picture is something we need to understand to fix it. But the other thing you know, um, I really loved about uh, the paper was, um, you know, this isn't charity, this is about ROI. The people that do this well win. Uh, and we've seen this in any number of employers. We see 
um, better attitudes, in many cases, better productivity. People attach to their employers more fully in many cases because this is not something that they've had in the past, right? And they see that opportunity going forward. So employers that engage well um, by bringing a broader population in find you know, a pool of great hires that they never thought existed. The other thing that happens, by the way, I think, is you have a much richer culture within a company by bringing in a much richer population. You see more innovation. You see different kinds of thinking. And I think we just see a, a, you know, a, a more whole community. Um, but I, I, I do you know, you know, want to point back, and, and, and Brent, you asked this question, this concept of onboarding and ensuring people can be successful is so important because we have to dignify who that individual is that comes into our door. Is that somebody that has certain challenges because of where they've been <clears throat> or because of you know, certain disabilities or whatever? And when we look at the individual and sort of dignify who they are and not only what, who they are not, we can begin thinking of those people differently as uh, in terms of the, the value that they bring to our organization. The other thing I want to mention is we, we are talking about this from two perspectives right now. Um, the first perspective, I think, is what hits a lot of us in our hearts. You know, we see, these, we see people who've got a, tre you know, a tremendous potential trajectory in front of them. Um, and, 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 and sort of this, you know, unmet opportunity for a changed life. And, you know, the, multi the, 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 you know, the generational impact that can have, the impact in our communities, that's really what grabs us in our hearts. And we see the benefit to employers who have a need. But I think if we don't, if we don't address this issue, it's, it's much bigger than that. I think this is about building a, a, you know, a society that, where we see opportunity and equity for many more people, many of whom have never enjoyed either. We see, I think, a pathway to begin healing a lot of the cultural divisions we have because I, so much of what we're dealing with is people feeling like they're, 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 they're left out of the prosperity in America uh, and, and by opening that for more people, I think it begins to hear, heal our divisions. And I also think it has implications for public policy, entitlement policy, labor policy, even trade policy. Um, and so uh, I think the, the, the op getting after this opportunity and ensuring that we can meet that need has very significant implications for our country on any number of levels. And, um, uh, and I, think, I, think, I, I think the solutions are out there. I, I, want the, I think that's a, a really an, a, a thoughtful way to look at it. Because in many cases, the conversation is about um, what are the new skills, the future skills. Mm. And yet we've all touched on if there is no child care, it doesn't matter if that person is a good match. And so if you look at policy programs like the G3 program in Virginia, for example, that includes uh, early childhood development and childhood education as part of that funded education. Now, there's, an, there's still an issue around, around cost of living and payment right, mm -hmm. for, for those workers. And that's a, we could have another conversation entirely around that. But it's important to understand that absent those, that support network, those, those people that are providing child care, it doesn't matter how much upskilling we do on the technical side because we're not going to be able to bridge those folks from the temporary or part-time jobs into a full-time career path. And mm. so that, that underpinning is incredibly important as we think about policy. How, are we sh how do we really be thoughtful about that? Yeah, I think that's really an interesting. Um, you know, we, we think about, okay, this is what employers need to do, and here's the conditions of the workers, and we've got to work on that. And then there's this whole middle piece of the kinds of supports that are necessary. And we, on another project that we're working on right now, this comes up over and over and over again, that um, while skills are an issue, that it has, to, it has to be dealt with, there are, in fact, some significant structural disadvantages that have to be overcome as well. It's not an either or, it's both and. And, uh, and that sometimes gets lost in this. I, part of me feels badly for employers in this conversation because 
we're constantly coming to them and saying, you've got to do more, you've got to be more, more outreach, more openness, more diversity, equity, inclusion, when you've got to do more. Um, and these businesses, of course, have other things that they have to do, right? But having said that, the, the pressures of the labor market are, are making this non-negotiable. It's for everybody. It's got to be addressed uh, because otherwise, they're just we have to do this if we're going to get the labor that we need in order to make this $23 trillion economy run. Yeah, Joe, did you want to yeah, well, I just wanted to point, point out something, and, and my research indicates that there are about 44% about of jobs in the United States pay less than 200% of the poverty line. We are a great economy at creating a large number of not very attractive jobs. And so uh, the, and, and those jobs have certain kind of um, curse of Cain and Abel or something on them. Because they're not very attractive, guess what happens? High turnover. Because if I can get 25 cents more an hour, yeah. or in my research, if suddenly uh, the city of Boston has a actually quite extensive and notoriously unreliable mass transit system called the MBTA. Did you um, say expensive or extensive? Extensive, expensive, <laughs> and unreliable. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole disaster. Uh, the, um, so suddenly the bus schedule changes. It's going to take me 55 minutes to get to that job as opposed to 25 minutes with a closer job. I'm going to switch jobs. So I'm an employer. I sit there and say, you know, my retail staff turns over 120% a year. Therefore, my job design needs to be really simple. It's got to be simple because a new person's got to be functional at it soon, quickly, or else I'm really in trouble. But it's going to be simple. It's going to be low paid because it's simple. It's not very productive. And comp you know, a lot of industries have accepted high turnover. I'm talking about 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent annual turnover. It's some kind of expression of Newtonian physics. It just happens. It's like gravity. There's nothing I can do about it. Most large employers also have a very large, diverse population of workers occupying their low-wage jobs. So the other topic that to be pursued here is rather than go to the spot market for labor to hire somebody for a job I know I'm going to need more of, why am I not going into that pool of the 44% of low paid jobs, my part of that pool, and saying, who do I have here as a proven good worker, good attendance record, it not has that, you know, well respected by their supervisor, sometimes used to onboard a new worker in that low wage one. I mean, why am I not investing in advancing that person to stay out of the spot market and achieve some other goals like better um, accomplishment on diversity. And Joe, do you think that's changing at all in this environment of, of such severe labor shortages? Or, uh, and I'm, we may not have data on this, yeah. but it'd be more impressionistic, but are yeah. employer attitudes changing about that? I think? think more employers are motivated to think about it. But um, I think it's very early innings. I think most large employers are still kind of shaking off the shock of COVID. And um, many of them are just trying to find, we have all had that sense in a swim pool of, wait a minute, I thought the bottom was there. You know, mm -hmm. Oops, I'm getting tired. Let me find the, the, the bottom of my toes. I think they're trying to understand that. But the, the infrastructure for upskilling, reskilling workers outside of the few large companies that were used to that in the United States is threadbare is generous. There aren't good programs um, for um, linking uh, skills infrastructure to middle skill, middle age workers, for example. Mm -hmm. If you say reskilling to a 45 year old who's been employed for 20 years, what do they hear? <coughs> school. How do they think about school? They don't want to go back. Uh, maybe they didn't like it. Maybe it wasn't their thing to begin with. Companies, a lot of companies, I'm afraid, do suffer from the conceit that somehow they personally 
their institutions immune from this, or what they're doing is obviously good because that's what they do, and what they do is good things. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we have a lot of thinking to do here, I, I must confess. I do like some of the type of catalytic steps taken by the, in the UK, for example, to effectively tax employers with payrolls of more than 100, put that tax revenue effectively in what it must escrow and rebate it to the employer if they invested in upskilling and come to workers. It's called the wage levy, which is a quick way to describe it in the UK. The Confederation of British Industry, when it was first proposed, were ranting and raving. It was terrible, awful disaster. You know, it was going to end civilization as we knew it. They're fine with it now. You know, I, yeah, I think ahead, it, it's interesting. I sort of feel like the, the, there's, a, there's a wave of energy around this that we're beginning to see. I think um, we are seeing more employers commit to rewriting their, their job descriptions when they're hiring. Uh, I saw a statistic recently come out from Indeed that is, they've seen a significant spike in employers that are advertising for skills rather than degrees. And a lot of the online um, uh, platforms that off offer certifications and other kinds of educational tools continue to spike. But what, and, and so there's, but, but I say that's sort of the first layer because the people that are going to avail themselves of an online certification or some kind of an online class are generally people who um, are sort of aware enough and comfortable enough and confident enough to enter that space, figure out what they need, and turn that into something. And I think taking a step forward and changing your job descriptions and beginning to hire differently is an important step forward. But I think as Joe's research shows, when you dig deeper into the populations we're talking about, you really have to think about how to onboard people effectively and really what, and, and answer a lot of questions. Uh, the, the, you know, what I've loved is seeing the statistics, both in your research and, and in other surveys, that show just the tremendous success that corporations have when they do pre bring people on. Um, um, but we have to get to those deeper layers of, of support, whether it's helping people through the process, like the child care and the transportation, um, and the deeper level of awareness of whom we're hiring and what it's going to be like to make, help that person be successful. I'll tell you, you know, one, of, one of the key elements of our secret sauce is pretty simple. It's called the career navigator. It's the person, when you come in and you, and, 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 and you need support, and you know, you know, your, your, your history is, is, has been somewhat bumpy, and somebody is sitting across from you and saying, I see who you are, I see who, what you bring to the table, I hear where you want to go, and I will work with you to help you get there. And that person all of a sudden sees the visibility of that pathway that they've never seen before, somebody who will walk with them through the journey and also you know, kind of coach them through the process. That is a huge driver of success rates for many of the people we serve. Yeah, I I, it's an incredibly important point because right now in this, in this labor market, employers have like one tool you know, to try to attract and retain talent. And that's increasing salaries and wages and, you know, but we're reaching a limit of, yeah. what, of what can be done in that regard. And so employers need to be thinking about the rest of what they do with their employees in order to retain, especially for retention, but, mm. but also for recruitment. Um, Ardeen, there, you wanted to jump there's in? A, there's, so I'd uh, really uh, two pieces there. The oh. The, the hidden pool, for us, I don't know that it's hidden, would be our existing workforce. We began a, what was probably an experiment in 2012, to as a, so a first dollar program, which means we pay the tuition, to our employees for in-demand jobs in the local community that pay more than we do. It was a very specific goal of training people for roles that existed outside of Amazon. Why? Because in many cases, you have a very large logistics facility and far fewer uh, supervisory or specialist positions for people to move into. Last year, uh, we modified that program and began, it was primarily focused on what I would call certificates and, uh, and then two-year degrees, so stackable credentials mm -hmm. and pathways. The problems that you articulated, Steve, are very much part of it. If, if I don't know what an advanced manufacturing technician is, it's very difficult for me to envision myself doing that. So it's the helping people understand what it is, adjusting schedules, all of the kinds of mechanics. 
But what we did this year was added bookends to it. And I think what I really enjoyed in the reading in the report was um, that it feels like we might be on the right path. One was to add uh, GED high school completion and English as a second language as the front end. Because we know that many of our middle skill workers, this may be their first job. It may be their first job in this country. They may be between jobs, but providing that foundational piece. Then the core that we've we've done since 2012, which is that stackable credential, mm -hmm. um, professional certification, two-year degree. And then we added the ability to gain a four-year degree, even if you already have one, because we know that the mythology that just get any degree doesn't guarantee yep. you a path to success. And so by putting those bookends on to that program that was started really to move associates out of Amazon into better paying jobs has become broader but we've also now, we are also now training our associates for roles inside the company. So data center technicians, opportunities to move into software, um, to work in our pharmacy operations. So there are jobs now that are internal, mm. and that has become a pipeline. And that was honestly not something that was envisioned. We were very explicitly focused on providing a career pathway in local communities because we know that that place-based mm job is is important and that's still the case right if i have to relocate the, the the friction for me to move is far greater than if i have the opportunity to stay in the community mm -hmm. and change employers how is that um how is that how has that changed amazon or how is that a, you know, what's the impact that i'd be love to hear because you're hitting on a lot of great things there and so when you you know you're you're a few years into it what are you what are you seeing well so we're this was so the the book ending it was january of this year oh, so that, that was, was post covid pretty recent. right very right. recent so um, more than we we know that more than 50,000 employees have participated in wow. career choice okay. uh, and remember this so i've been with the company uh, 7 years and change and when i joined the company we were fewer than 140,000 people mm -hmm. and we're 1.6 million now. So the company's grown pretty dramatically. So while that number doesn't seem large, um, you have to kind of look at that, mm -hmm. that scale. I'll come back to you and let you know I'm incredibly excited about it because we've learned from helping lift people into jobs outside Amazon that we have to do things like bring the training into our facilities, to do schedule adjustments so that they can take advantage of the training, to make sure that we, if they're doing something online, that they have study groups to curate the providers so that they're not just going to any uh, you know, uh, institution that's right. advertising. You want to have, you said something earlier, you said a marginal, what was your word, a marginal educator? You had, when we were talking earlier. Oh, you know, I throw around so many phrases, I forget what I okay, say sometimes. Well, <laughs> but it was something to the effect of, hey, I'm getting a, I may be getting a, a piece of paper, but I may not be getting. Yep. The, something that's the, worthwhile. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, well, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Your turnover is going to go down. Your engagement number is going to go up. Your ability to track better candidates for those entry-level jobs will be enhanced. Yeah, be, that's what all the data suggests. And I, I, I want to come back to something that Steve introduced, which is this, this idea of a, a guide, a mentor. In the building from the bottom up research I mentioned, We've isolated out of 60 different practices an employee-employee relationship, three or four that really drove the ability of a low-wage worker to get promoted out of the low-wage band. And one of them was there was some type of mentor, didn't have to be formal, but some type of mentor actually took an interest in me. And that, that um, navigator, that guide, that person provides encouragement, you can see that works in these populations across multiple different models. Which online university has easily the best results in terms of income outcomes? Western governors. What does Western governors provide? A matrix, so you have the equivalent of a TA in every course, so I don't understand whatever it is I'm studying. I can get direct help on the subject, but I have someone who's helping me manage my entire Western governors experience that kind of navigational role. Guild education. They don't say, here, find a pro program you want to take. There's someone you're talking to. They're helping you make those selections. Is this the right one with you? I understand what the employer, I'm, where, you, where you work at, how they view your career progression. I am, um, I, I solve the problems with the university providers of the courses. 
for you rather than you calling up the registrar's office or the IT department of some university saying, I'm a guild client, I'm supposed to be taking this course. It, effectively, it's an expediter, it's a deep bottlenecker. And yes, it's a cheerleader. Um, the, the fun, the, uh, another thing I just want to throw out because of course we are here in our nation's capital is a big issue in skills and credentials attainment is liquidity. There really isn't any independent liquidity in the market. Our dean's talking about essentially Amazon providing liquidity in the market for skills building. They're paying for it, their first dollar, they're changing the schedule. The only liquidity that flows into the market from the government is through the Higher Education Act. And the Higher Education Act is literally like the Flying Dutchman. It's an ancient ship that sails around, nobody's on. You know, so sooner or later, someone's going to have to get close to it, throw grappling hooks on it, and you know, take the wheel and start changing uh, a, a, a funding mechanism that's strongly rooted in the logic of higher education in 1964, mm -hmm. when 6% of people graduated from college, and turn it into something that funds programs that are less than 100 hours that funds programs by non-accredited institutions, that encourages accredited institutions to partner with businesses like Amazon to create a credential that's informed by what employers actually <coughs> want, which is an important point that Brent introduced. Educators sit around guessing or funding programs they can afford to fund, even though they're irrelevant to uh, job market, and being wondering why so many of their graduates have lousy outcomes. So the, 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 the getting the federal, you know, the $130 billion a year we, we spend on, on grants and loans, and yes, increasing substantially Pell Grant nominal amounts, which haven't grown very quickly, but making, letting the market clear there as opposed to trying to, it's one of the most tightly regulated and archaically regulated markets in the United States. And we have to view it as a deregulation problem, not mm -hmm. a how we're going to drive more outcomes by telling specifically what this type of person can do on this day of the week. You cannot get your student loan money dispersed outside the academic year because loans only need to be dispersed when the bursar's office is open at universities. I mean, you, this stuff is so goofy you can't make it up. And, so, and, 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 we, if, we don't, and if we don't solve that problem, it's going to fall only on the back of big companies, and they'll do a lot of lifting, but they don't employ most Americans. That's right. right. And this is the point I wanted to get to that's on right. this topic, which is companies like Amazon, Walmart, that they're, they're in there providing this liquidity, this flexibility, yes. this they've got they've got enough resources and enough market share that it's not too risky for them to do it, right? You start going down the ladder and you pretty quickly get into a very rigid uh, and much you know, sort of less resourced areas of the economy. And so one of the one of the, the blockages here, one of the rigidities is for a medium sized employer is why should I invest all this money in training when it just means this person is going to pack up and leave me. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on like how do we how do we insure against that risk? How do we how do we de-risk it so that employers are more open to yep. investment like that? Let me start, but I'm very interested in what Ardina said about this too. I think one thing, first of all, my research indicates that almost two-thirds of low-wage workers, their first preference is to stay where they're currently employed if there are upper mobility possibilities for them there. So the notion that I train somebody up and they walk out the door and I'm, I'm the greater fool because I invested in their skills and then they trade it up. Yes, if you train somebody to, who, who is a medical orderly to be a radiologist, they're probably gonna go be a radiologist somewhere. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the actual types of work we're talking about, yeah. that fear is overstated. Mm -hmm. And comp where, where most comp uh, workers actually get out of, of uh, a low wage job into a better paying position over 200%, they, 84% of them changed industries. So the idea that, well, they're gonna walk down the street and work for my arch rival, at least that venom can be, can be drawn. Um, 
I think the, 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 a difficulty is in a small company, particularly small or medium company, very often there aren't that many jobs to advance to. Our dean mentioned this as a problem in warehouse operations. If, if you're in an advanced manufacturing plant, the ratio of supervisors to workers is, is 1 to 30. So it might be a long wait before you become a supervisor. Uh, so, but, but the, the, I think also just to, to evoke some, a theme I raised earlier, Brent, there's this self-fulfilling logic you see in a lot of companies. The job's high turnover, so it's got to be low skills, so it's got to be low wage because it's high turnover and it's not, you know, I'm ignoring the fact that it's low skill and low wage and that's what drives turnover. Um, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not going to train these people up because they're just going to leave and they're leaving because you're not training them up. They're not leaving because, yeah. they don't see because a you, yeah, they don't see a future. Yeah. So we had a, we, we worked with Gallup last year and had a study and it's very consistent with what Joe's research showed, which is if you offer 65%, I think people said, Hey, if a job offered me the opportunity for upskilling, I, I would take it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a there's this very kind of interesting intertwining of these things. The first piece is the very first when we built the apprenticeship program. One of the questions that I was asked in the executive approval of it was, um, well, what if aren't we training them for, you know, these are the people who go to work at Microsoft or Google or whatever? Why are we? How do we know they won't leave? And I said, you know, we we don't know that they're not going to leave. But I will tell you that in the apprenticeship program, our first cohort of 15, we lost one. Mm. And we lost it to a competitor, but we lost that, appren that apprentice before they got to the journey worker point because they had upskilled just enough that they mm -hmm. were competitive and didn't want to finish the program sure. out. And the, the statistics are better than that mm -hmm. now with more than 1,000 apprentices trained. But the piece that's kind of interesting on the small to medium-sized business, I think, what is it, 80% of, of people employed in the U.S. are employed by small to medium-sized businesses, right? So it's like not, that, yeah. or maybe it's 75%. Companies that have the scale can do this. The opportunity is, whether it's through the Higher Education Act or WIOA or whatever, to take advantage of where you have community colleges, but not the community college where we have a lot of success is on the not-for-credit side, because those are the folks who are tied into the business community. Yeah. They're innovative. They're not bound by the our, sort of arcane rules that I don't begin to understand. But if we can create those programs, and they are specifically focused on the jobs that are either in demand in the community or the, the work that's, not, that's going undone right, in the community because those people aren't available. If you have you know, dark fiber running through and you're trying to do middle and last mile connection for optical, you need splicers. If you don't have splicers, if you don't have network engineers, that's not going to get done. So working with the local economic development folks and the workforce development and interleaving those is essential. You see a lot of good activity at the levels of local chambers of commerce yep, on that. And absolutely. U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation did work on a so-called talent management pipeline model applying supply chain management principles to cultivating workforce. Full disclosure, I was co-author of that paper, so I'm very fond of it. But um, you know, they have taken that much further than we imagined making it programmatic, working with local chambers. And that is, we have you have to find some type of aggregator, intermediator for those the small and medium businesses, convening yep. uh, um, certifiers, if you will, of the legitimacy of the program and, and making the economic case to uh, mayors, county executives, governors, that that's what it's going to take because uh, otherwise it will become a, a further um, force behind this barbellization of the workforce we currently right. see. Big pool of, of low wage, Low uh, upward mobility jobs, and then a, a big, a, you know, big pool of uh, cognitive jobs, less routine, more corporate in nature, and the only people moving down that that narrow part of the barbell are people who are working at the Amazons and the WalMarts and the J.P. Morgan Chases mm -hmm. because they are taking a leadership uh, both out of civic duty, but also as 
as Steve said earlier, because there's an ROI case. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing well by doing good. They're not just involved in corporate philanthropy. Yeah, the, the, chamber, so, the, the chambers are uh, uh, particularly the local. They have to have the yeah. leadership at the state level. Yes. So Virginia has the leadership at the state level. But those local chambers That's have been happens. incredibly powerful for me as a workforce development professional because they understand the local market mm -hmm. and they know what's in demand. And so we can work closely with them as we have centers where we've got our employees say, okay, what's, what's missing? It's that new geography of jobs. Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I so think, I wanna, let me, can I just add one thing, yeah, just a well, little bit of, just one more dimension to this. Employers need to believe in the value of what they're doing, right? And there's two elements of value, you know, one we've already brought up, one is, it, it's expensive, <laughs> turnover is expensive. And if you can significantly reduce your turnover, you have a lot more money to invest in those employees, to pay them better, to provide them better benefits. And we've seen models out there of, Companies in the same industry who do this well and are able to do that. And, uh, and secondly, when we're talking about hidden workers here, once again, many of those people attach better. Many of them are more engaged when they find meaningful work, um, when they find an employer that, um, that they respect, that they feel you know, a part of. It's worth it to invest in those people because it does provide that ROI. And so um, I think those are two really important dimensions for employers to understand because there is value there by investing in people. So I want to do a little workshopping here. We have a major employer and we have somebody who works closely with a number of different hidden worker populations. Um, so what is it that you're your populations that you're working with need in order to make the connection to the job at the the job at Amazon that has the career pathway. What where are the big disconnects um, for your populations? What would you advise an Amazon or any other big company or any other company that is th is thinking about your clients, your uh, the, the folks in your domain as a goodwill? Uh, what what do they need to be doing in order to make those employment opportunities viable? Right. So first of all, before this, I told our dean she should start publishing all the Amazon stuff so they can be sort of the, the, the poster <laughs> child here with a lot of their great work. I do think employers need to see those success stories at other employers, and not just the headlines, but see the techniques and what it really takes. Uh, I think for employers... Um, there are a couple of things. Uh, you know, uh, Joe very importantly brought up the screening mechanisms right now. You have to, like, you have to think of the labor pool differently and ensure that you're, what you are doing um, uh, expands your visibility and your access to that pool. And you have to really understand what mechanisms you have within your organizations that are doing that. Some of those are automated. Some of those are attitudes. Uh, uh, and, um, and so, number one, you need to address that. Uh, number two, when you bring people in to interview them and you evaluate them, you have to begin evaluating at that level with different criteria and really begin understanding what does that person bring to the table and what are they going to need to help them be successful in my environment in terms of skills. And then I think the third piece I would say is... Um, if you are working with a particular population, we got into this a little earlier, if you're working with a particular population with particular challenges or particular need, particular gifts, um, how do I accommodate in the, that in the workplace in a way that helps that person be successful? Uh, and um, once again, I think, uh, you know, a lot of employers are kind of scared. Like, what's this going to, like, how am I going to do this? How will my other, how are the rest of my employees think? But when you look at the people that are doing it su successfully, the benefits are very far-reaching. So think about your, your automated screening. When you bring people in to interview them, really understand what they bring to the table and how they might contribute. But then make sure when you bring them into the organization, they are, uh, they are um, able to be successful based on onboarding and the way that the organization receives them. One of the things uh, you know, that we've seen among a number of organizations is when they're looking at the hidden worker population, um, some of the smaller and medium-sized companies will lean into a particular population so that they're ready to 
um, uh, accommodate people more effectively. A lot of people with strong veterans programs. Uh, a number of organizations increasingly with programs that reach out to people who've been impacted by the justice system. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that that is a great sort of first step into this, you know, into this landscape uh, to be able to drive all of those factors. Okay, so Ardeen, now it's your turn. What, what looking to these partners like Goodwill, who are trying to bring hidden workers, especially people often who have one or more barriers uh, to work, what what is it that they need to understand about the needs of Amazon or any other company that's yeah. that is looking at them as potential employees. So, so Steve made some really good points. Eliminate, reduce your false negatives. Right. What you're really looking to do is eliminate false negatives in your in your selection. Ensure that as you're as you're if you do have an interview process as you're interviewing that there's someone on that debrief panel that speaks the language of the person that you interviewed. Whether mm -hmm. it's it's military, someone on the um, on the autism spectrum, if it's someone who is uh, who is deaf. You want to make sure that you've got a, a translator, not that, that you can simply say, oh, when Ardeen said, uh, gave you a very short clipped answer, that was what, you know, that didn't mean that she didn't know what she was talking about. Here's mm -hmm. what that translates mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, what I would say is, as an employer, we need partners like Goodwill to lean in. When we built, we, we built a pilot program for deaf workers in one of our warehouses, and that we were scared about that. I mean, I'll be really honest. Warehouses are noisy. You exp the the sound of heavy of alarms on heavy machinery alerts people to um, to mm -hmm. danger in the area. There's a lot of, of of verbal communication that happens, and we needed partners working with us that understood that population that helped us understand we could put. Um, deaf and hearing impaired impaired associates in a spe in a specific safety vest color so that other workers were aware of it, that we had a manager who went to additional training who understand how important it was to look at someone who depended on lip reading. Um, to how do, you, how do you educate the broader population so that that group feels welcome, so they don't feel like the special color vest that they have is setting them apart, it's actually bringing them in. And it's partners like Goodwill who are expert in that and really inviting them to lean in and to push us to say, no, here's how you need to think about that. And then be willing to fail, to bring that in, experiment, and when something doesn't work, change it on the spot and incorporate that learning and continue to make the program better. And again, mm. that's where partners are incredibly powerful. That's great. Joe, I want to give you a chance, just if you've got something you want to respond to in that, and then we're going to go to questions from this audience and from online. So. Well, I just I think that all the resources are available for employers to um, pull together a coherent approach. It can be on a very modest scale, but there are a large number of local, not just national, uh, not for profits, or there are local chapters of something like Goodwill Industries that that can help you navigate this. They're actually anxious to do it. Um, the, there is, it does not matter where you are, I think it does track the workforce participation rates that there are going to be an ample supply of, of hidden workers from multiple different categories of hidden workers in any jurisdiction you're operating in. And, if you, and, and there are companies and increasingly um, are role models for how to do this. So this is not an unknown world. It's just a question of getting the, the readily accessible navigational help um, uh, integrated in a way so you can act. And I think quite importantly, to think through this issue of matching. Mm. Uh, this is not, um, I, I've got this job which I need filled and I'm, gonna, I, I'm going to just change the way I assess uh, applicants to reduce false negatives. It's this would seem to be a job that would fit well with this population. That's a hypothesis tested. It may be disproven. But if it, if it looks correct and, it, and you get some encouragement on it, then it's not, you're, not re you're not inventing a wheel here. There are others will be able to ease you down that path. And, and often companies that are very enthusiastic, uh, uh, who, who have gone down this path, are very enthusiastic about it. If you talk to the people, for example, at CVS, 
you know, they have a whole management team that essentially handles the way they approach hidden workers, and they are absolute. That they are they are um, uh, ambassadors for this idea. They're they're willing to help you now. Whether they're willing to help Walgreens, maybe not so much. I don't know, uh, but uh, or, or maybe not even Amazon, or Dean. But you know, they they uh, they can direct you to resources. Or they'll accept your visit. They'll trade. They'll give you that kind of inside baseball stuff that Ardeen was illustrating with the hearing impaired workers. I think that workforce development, interesting, I'd be curious your opinion, is is not unlike the, I mean, the veterans work is a great example. It's, it, it, we're a community. I mean, we, I, the, the workforce development folks at Walmart are, are frequently at the same mm -hmm. conferences. We, we trade ideas and talk about things. There's a, a, this is a team sport, yep. mm -hmm. and there's, you know, the, if we make the pie bigger, we all win. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, altruistic, but that's the reality. I think so. I, I think, think you're right. I think what Steve was saying, also, people are increasingly aware that what we're talking about are profound issues of social justice right. mm -hmm. in the country, and and the failure to address them, I think, has contributed to the corrosion of our society, and will continue to unless we start coming up with answers other than. This is what the Almighty ordained, and we're just going to have to live with it. That's not the case. I, I, I just I want to pause on that point. I think that's so important, Joe. I, I think when somebody comes through our door, we often see the accumulation of inequities in a person's life over many years. And many of the people that we work with are in a place um, because of their history, and, and, and there are a lot of influences that go into that. And we can't change the past with that person. We, hopefully we can change a lot of things going forward. We, but, but we can help that person change the trajectory of their future. Um, and so many people who come to us are so desirous of that. They just want to, you know, they're sort of on the outside looking in in society and saying, like how, like, how do I get into that? Like, how do I get on that trajectory? How do I change the future of my life? And um, this is a huge issue of equity. And this is where I, I think we see such, th this is a crux um, of, of issues that come together that we see. And, and um, we, need to, we, we need to help people move beyond where they are. Couldn't agree more. And I, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that I see all over the place, right? This isn't, uh, th there are so many people in this country who are stuck Mm -hmm. um, they're not always coming through goodwill. I mean, I, you just see this everywhere. They need another resource that can help them break out of that feeling that they can't imagine a different future different than the past they've already had. Yeah, some of our best stories, I, I was just <laughs> looking at a video the other day from one of our affiliates, and once again, the person said, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't have anyone to turn to. And within like six months, she was in an apprenticeship program at Accenture. This is a person who didn't have language skills, had no digital skills whatsoever, went through one of our programs, Accenture brought her into an internship program, and they ultimately hired her into uh, an apprenticeship program. And, uh, and it's astounding. Yeah. It's astounding how close some people are, uh, who, and, and with the right types of support, how, how their lives can be unalterably changed for the better. And, I, and what you're just and the, and the the fortunate ones come in through someone like Goodwill and yeah. your affiliates. This was a state agency that referred her to us. She wouldn't have known otherwise. And, and, and so this is the yeah. and the, the the time gap was really short, but the path that that individual had to travel was that was was, long. was difficult. Yeah. And without a Sherpa or a learning mentor or the insight to help connect the dots into kind of how do I get her from point A to point B it wouldn't happen. And the fact that a state agency center to you just, I think, also speaks to not, that's clearly the, the, the capability that you all have, but shouldn't we be thinking about policy that we, where we can leverage that at the state and local level? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I, I know we want to get to questions, Brett, but just Sorry. briefly, yeah. uh, no, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> take I've got something I myself. need to say about this. Uh, yeah. Too, so uh, go ahead. The, the, um, we do need to move away from the notion that we're going to come up with programmatic solutions that address all populations in one fell swoop. It just doesn't work. Uh, they get to be such either low or high common denominator that it's ineffective. And 
I think the trick here is if you at, at, at from a state executive level or a federal government level, what you ought to be doing is um, trying to make the market work better. You, you should not be trying to own the outcomes, run the programs. So if you really go back to my UK illustration, if you really think you want to, you want more companies to invest in upscaling who they've got, give them an active incentive to do that. Don't tell them how to do it. Don't start your own upscaling mm -hmm. infrastructure. If you want, if if you're a, if you're a, I happen to be married to a mayor. So if uh, if your if your problem is you don't have uh, organized childcare for your uh, for your small local satellite plants in your third tier city, but you've got a disused public school, get the Chamber of Commerce in. Says I'll sell you this for a dollar, and I'll use some ARPA money to to you know, upgrade it to code, and you guys get together and put together a child care consortium or maybe a senior cognitive unit here, depending on your demographics, to, so you keep more employees, they don't turn over, they're more productive, they're not suffering from presenteeism where they show up for work, but they're so worried that their eight-year-old's home from two to six by themselves that they're not being productive anyhow. Uh, and your tax revenue stays in my jurisdiction. I got rid of a building I didn't need, and everybody wins. But if you don't, if if the legislation doesn't allow you to do that, if I'm waiting for someone to tell me exactly how it's got to be run, exactly which way, mm -hmm. what you're going to do is pour more and more concrete on this on this uh, polarized system of employment we've got with all the concomitant outcomes, unhappy outcomes that we've been referring to. That's terrific. Um let's not pour any more concrete. I, <laughs> I, I think that it's uh, one of the things that's really encouraging about this conversation is that they're, what a great country we live in, right? There are, wherever there's a problem, there are people working on it. Uh, one of my heroes in this work uh, is Beth Babcock at Empath um, up in Boston, who is really doing such tremendous work on helping people with this reimagination process um, she, you know, one of the points she makes in her talks all the time is that um, stress makes us stupid, and poor people are very stressed. Um, and because they're so stressed, decision making mm. is extremely difficult. But we all suffer from it. When we get under stress, we lose a standard deviation of intelligence um, just from being under stress. But if you're poor, you're under stress all the time, mm -hmm. and you need. You need a resource to help you back up mm -hmm. from your problems to take a broader view. And I do think we've really underinvested in that, that kind of category. We've relied on sort of the, um, the instincts of our people to self-start. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a very tall order yeah. for men, not all, but many of the hidden worker populations. The, the idea of self-starting is... <laughs> To, to heap another burden on top of a whole bunch of others. So. There are so many presumptions in that in that attitude. You know, yeah. first of all, your your comment about stress. They're not only stressed. The stakes are really high. Yeah. Like I'm stressed about. They're my stressed board for good reason. I'm stressed for my board meeting yeah. this week. Okay, I'm I'm going to eat. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to everything yeah. else is going to be fine, right? Yeah. Housing insecurity, food insecurity. How am I going to provide for my family? The stakes are high. The other thing is, in terms of the self-starter issue, and I think this is this is also a really important point. I'm, brought, I'm glad you brought it up. Is people have never seen somebody who's been a self-starter before. Nobody's ever mm -hmm. shown them the pathway. Like this is how you do it. Like there aren't there aren't pathways. There aren't. I mean, if you grew up in a certain zip code. <laughs> How you know how to get through life is very, if I grew up in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago and I'm an 11 year old boy, I probably need to join a gang if I'm gonna to get to school yeah. safely every day. Yeah. I need to know how not to, you know, where the violence is. I know that when I get to that school, it's not gonna be about education, it's gonna be about survival. Like, how I have learned how to navigate my life and the skills I've learned and sort of the, you know, the stress, even the longer term implications, those are such huge issues when we, when, we, when we consider how to help people move forward. 
And, um, and, we, and we have to respect that when that person comes to us, depending on the, you know, the level of challenges they've had, we have to respect who they are and why they are at that place if we're truly going to help them move forward. Right, right. Good word. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, do we have any questions in the room first? We've got a couple online, but we'll go with the in person first. My name is Don Dakin. I'm an interested citizen. Um, it's astonishing that there are that many hidden workers out there. Uh, but has the government ever tried to find them? Well, um, not in so many words. Uh, I mean, the, the, go the government uh, has um, is more focused on the technically unemployed uh, and has had multiple largely unsuccessful interventions to try to create... Uh, untap the potential of the so-called long-term unemployed. Um, but the, the, the government is not good at segmentation. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't say, if we look at the, um, let's say the, there's one of the larger categories in the hidden worker populations, are people who are unemployed but open to going back to work, not actively looking for work. So a significant mm -hmm. subpopulation there is the recently retired. Um, the government is good at thinking about you're retired or you're not retired. You're a worker or you're retired. And, and so if you wanted to say to those people who have recently retired, the retirement rate is beginning to reverse a little bit, but it jumped very sharply during COVID. Um, why, why did they retire, and what, what would it take to get them to come back? So I'll just give you a pet peeve of mine. Why do we charge Social Security payroll tax to people over the age of 65 who are working? Let's just abolish that on both sides. So the employers get an 8% incentive to hire, or hire an older worker, and we give an 8% raise to people. But what, and now I've, I have three sons, and they might start telling me, this is another way that you're going to tax my population to support your extravagant lifestyle. I don't know what, what, what their complaint is today. But um, what, what, what you would say, what you'd say is, well, if that person's able and willing, excited to stay working, they're going to not consume their retirement savings as fast. We know they're staying active in the workforce. It's co-linear with better health outcomes. But the, the, the government isn't, doesn't get down to that level of detail. So it's really, if you say to them, um, large number of companies have part-time workers, develop specific programs to encourage people, employers to actively consider converting those people to full-time. You're al it's almost too detailed now for them. It's like, you know, I just want the jobs program of 2024, you know. Maybe, you know, maybe that's in the administrative law writing or something. So that would be my answer. Brent, I mean, you've been studying this forever. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there are certain types of hidden workers that the government pursues pretty aggressively. Uh, if you are a single mom on welfare, Government's there trying to get you back into the workforce. Uh, if you um, trying to think of so one of the uh, if you are a, a non custodial parent who owes child support, <laughs> boy is the government yeah. there to uh, try to get it out of you and make sure that if you aren't employed that you get employed so you can start taking care of your kids. But we've got a whole we've got vast swaths of, of people who have just disengaged for one reason or another. And what we need, I think, are these kinds of tailored strategies that meet the needs of business, that align workers to jobs, that, you know, it's, it's very difficult work, it's hard work, it's expensive work, um, but we're, we're getting to the point where we just don't have any choice. Um, and because we aren't having as many children, and, you know, we've shut off immigration, and we, you know, we are digging this this problem deeper for ourselves over time. Yeah. So it's uh, you know it's a pay me now or pay me later kind of um, 
uh, question that we have to confront. Um, we have a question online, uh, and it, it gets to something that I had intended to ask, so that's perfect. Um, uh, <clears throat> it goes to this question of the kinds of software and algorithms that we're using to screen um, employees. Uh, I, and uh, the question is, is there hope for these technologies? Can they be, can they be uh, modified in such a way that they can, that we can get the benefit of them, which is the efficiency and the speed yep. and so on without the downside? Yep. Yes, is the short answer. And uh, when I wrote, um, published the Hidden Workers paper, I must admit I had some trepidation that I get a lot of inbound from Oracle that owns PeopleSoft, that has uh, the biggest market share in the space, and companies like Indeed, Monster, and whatnot. Um, and almost uniformly, I got quite a lot of inbound, and it was uh, happily um, favorable. And the, 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 I'm not going to attribute this to any particular company, but essentially they're what they would say is, um, we build our tools based on the requirements stated by our customers. And our customers are saying, get me that, pool, take that 300 applicants down to five as fast as possible with find the tightest possible fit. Find but, me a unicorn as fast as you can. Well, it doesn't have to be, find me a perfect fit. Yeah. And, 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 and there's an embedded sub, uh, uh, supposition there, which is now under pressure which is if they apply, they're going to accept if I give it to them, give them mm. the offer. You have a lot of people accepting offers and not even showing up on day one because in the meantime, they got something better and they forgot to, you know, they didn't even, you know, they ghosted us. Um, so the, the um, what we can move to increasingly, and AI, particularly when you get to the layer of so-called cognitive AI, which is what's really emerging now, which is getting beyond just understanding correlation, but beginning to intuit much more about causation, it is we're, we should be able to build systems that jump the wall between my job descriptions and my performance management system data. So now I can see what are the attributes of someone at the point of being hired that succeeded in the job. What skills did we, did they have? What experiences they have? Yeah, you might, as it gets more, more cognitively able, it'll get by the problem, the, you know, the historical problem of, you know, what do you want to be, you know, what, who should Harvard Business School hire as a professor, you know, white men of sub, substantial business experience or academic accomplishment, because that's what all the data set says from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and my, well, full disclosure, my parents are both Harvard professors. So there were white women in there too, occasionally. Um, but in any case, we, we can, the, the tools can be made over time to be much more oriented toward uh, understanding some skills and background as opposed to credentials that we infer bestow skills. So we say someone with a criminal conviction, we're inferring that they're going to be a defective employee. We, we know nothing about that individual, just saying, I'm giving that blanket inference. Someone with a college degree, I'm inferring. Uh, I think some recent research I published finally breaks the code on something. We've long thought that, that employers use college degree as a proxy for social skills, for soft skills. And what we found in this research I published at Burning Glass Institute was that if someone removed the college degree requirement for the job description, what happened? The verbiage on soft skills got much more extensive in the job description. Hmm. So it looks like there's a correlation yeah, there. So you were correct in your assumption. Yeah. Uh, yes, and I, I wouldn't have mentioned it if I weren't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to give I want to give Ardeen a chance to weigh in on this too because she's, you know, big company, uh, uh, highly automated. What, how, what's your perspective I, on this? I think that you, you know, models are only as good as the work that goes into designing them. And then I think to, to Joe's point, how you continue to retrain them. I mean, we, one of the most effective retrain ways... Retrain the models, you're talking retrain about. Retrain the model, yeah. yes, absolutely. And natural language processing is a great example of that. If, you get the, if you're not getting the results that you think you should be getting, you need to go back and look at your model. 
I'm very excited about this, the, this op the opportunity that we have. I'm, I tend to be optimistic, so, is when you look and say, these are people who have been successful, and then be able to go back and look at, not at the, at the, and know that there is, in fact, a, a, a causation there versus it just being correlated. Because it could be a zip code on a resume that's causing the matches in, mm. uh, in mm -hmm. a model. So is there hope on the model side? Yeah, I think so. And I think that the reality is when you're screening thousands of resumes a day or hundreds of thousands of resumes, you, you have to have some winnowing. But I love the example of taking off that, that, that degree requirement and what it forces a hiring manager to do who likely just pulled an old job description out and did a little bit of tweaking and threw it back out mm -hmm. onto the That's web. exactly what happens. And so... Um, you know, maybe it's time that we, we worked a little harder um, describing what we really want. I think that's a great note. Oh, we've got, we have one more question in the room. I had a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So this is really, really fascinating. One question I had on kind of the, the, the hiring side for employers, are there any labor regulations that are currently kind of in their, you know, in their framework that they're looking at that they're causing them to make certain decisions that might prevent them from reaching kind of a hidden worker population. I know you talked about the kind of the higher education piece of this and how we need to kind of retool the regulation. I was wondering, you know, is there any sort of insight into the, the regulatory environment surrounding hiring and labor, you know, hiring practices um, that, you know, could be looked at or reconsidered? Well, I can set a couple of quick examples. I mean, companies are very nervous about assembling data about applicants because once they own it, it's a legal reality, and they don't want to wish they didn't own it in some future lawsuit, which may or may not have merit. The second is there have been judgments, for example, about going way back to the 70s about, for example, if you do pre-employment aptitude testing and uh, more than 80% of any uh, stipulated population fails it. Adverse impact. You, you, you have an adverse impact, and then the employer has to prove they're not acting prejudicially. I'd love to blow that thing up because it, what happened, either pre-employment uh, testing stopped, which meant a bunch of people who were qualified but didn't necessarily look perfect get excluded, uh, or also get, gets given to third parties to do. Because, well, I just, you know, mm -hmm. I just hired that mm -hmm. firm and they yeah. did this bad thing. Go and see bad, them. Bad. Go yeah. see them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, so, and that is a concern. I think the, 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 the flip side of that is on adverse impact testing, it forces you to continue to refine that model. Sure. So you do the testing, and it, when you develop this, the tool or you have a third party develop it, you actually test it internally on people who are in that role, and you ensure that you're not creating, uh, that you're not, dis, you're not disparately evaluating right. people. But that, that's a classic, elegant, big company solution. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if but if you're if you're a mid-sized employer, you just say my my see my chief legal officer said don't do that. You know that's we're not going to do it. So we're just going to rely on what we're allowed to do. How big is mid-sized? You know, I, well, uh, I'm talking about a hundred million dollar company, something like that. Yeah. I also would would point to uh, people who've had a history of incarceration, uh, and it's not always a regulatory issue. It's often certain industries industry credentialing, any number of other barriers for somebody uh, who's been incarcerated. Um, and even for us, when we, we have a number of programs that we run specifically uh, for people when they've, when they've come out, and the hurdles that they need to go through in many cases to qualify for a program in terms of documentation and records and all the kinds of things that many of these people don't have because of where they've been can actually shut them out of the very aid that they need right, exactly. to be able to move forward in their lives. So that, that is a, you know, <laughs> that's a population, you know, people come out with often no money, no job, no housing, no network. And then they're faced with these like significantly higher hurdles um, it can be extremely difficult for people to move forward in their lives. Okay, well, this has been a wonderful exchange. I want to thank all the panelists, Joe especially, for the excellent work uh, on the study and, uh, and his ongoing partnership with us here at AEI. Ardeen, thank you very much for coming in and giving us uh, the, the view from Amazon. And Steve, thank you for all of your work with those who need the most help. Uh, really appreciate it. 
and we hope you come back for this audience and that audience out in the world. Uh, we'll come back for our next session on workforce development. Thank you. Thank you.